Dial 911 for potholes, the big stories yet to come, and next year's presidential race. Stay put. My week starts right now. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there, and welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining us. You know, with pothole season upon us, we all know how dangerous some of those craters can be. And for the second year, Macomb County residents have been told to dial 911 if they see a pothole that could cause severe damage to their vehicles. The goal? To get the pothole assessed and fixed right away. So coming up, we're going to talk with the man behind the pothole plan, Macomb County Executive Mark Hackle. And we'll get his thoughts on Proposal 1 as a means of fixing the roads. Plus, what are the big stories coming up in Detroit and Michigan? We will take a crack at making some predictions for you. And who will be our next president? We'll take a look at the growing list of hopefuls for next year's race. It is all coming up for you on my week. But we do start with Macomb County. Not everyone agrees that 911 should be used to report dangerous potholes. But County Executive Mark Hackle says it's a good way to fix some of the area's worst roads. He joins us now. Mark, it's good to see you back here on my week. Thanks, Christy. Thanks. And obviously, Stephen Nolan, thank you for having us. Yeah, also our contributors here, Nolan Finley from the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson from the Detroit Free Press. All right, so Mark, we love that this is the second year in a row that you You've done this dial 911 for potholes. People would not agree that that's the best usage of 911, but since you've rolled this out the last couple of weeks, what have the results been? What have you guys that's seen? That's been the misperception. I think what happened is you had the state police got involved in this early on, and they don't receive 911 calls from anyone, and that was interesting. We do, and we have. Re we were receiving calls, 911, where people were damaging their vehicles and or there was a hazardous situation dealing with potholes. So people were calling 911 for that purpose, which is a proper thing to do. And so when they did, our road department came up with a solution and said and asked me as the, uh, the executive responsible for roads, said, hey, listen, we can get out there. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, within one hour, if you will okay the overtime to do that, if there is a dangerous situation dealing with a pothole, and we get that call from one of those centers. And my response to them was, absolutely. Uh, we are gonna make sure that we keep those roads safe, and we relieve law enforcement of having to sit there or stand guard of a pothole so somebody else doesn't have that same problem. Well, in doing so, there was a perception that was given out that we are telling people to call 911 because there is a pothole. Very inappropriate. And how that got out through the media was not through our office. I mean, we were very specific on the fact that if a 911 center calls us on a pothole that has damaged a vehicle and probably will damage someone else's vehicle, we will get out there within one hour. I mean, we came up with a solution to help make sure that people aren't going to damage their vehicles and or put themselves in a hazardous situation. Someone else was getting out there saying it's inappropriate for you to tell people to call 911 when there's potholes. That is not what we did. And our solution has been working. Uh, we're working with the local municipalities. There wasn't one problem with our law enforcement agencies in Macomb County and or the sheriff of Macomb County and or our road department. So for somebody else to tell us what we should or shouldn't be doing with 911 in Macomb County, uh, when we're out there trying to fix a problem that is beyond really the uh, the real concern here, and that's fixing roads, uh, I was disappointed in that. I, I'm thinking if it works for us, we're going to continue to do it because it's about keeping people safe in Macomb County. All right, so what have the results been in the last couple of weeks, and what kind of calls have you received, and what are the conditions right now? It's in interesting. County? I have yet to have a news story that's been up on, uh, on TV talking about somebody who's been uh, injured because of a pothole in Macomb County. Why? Because we're getting to that solution, and we've been able to address that, and we're dealing with it. So really, there hasn't been the problems in Macomb County. Are there potholes? Absolutely. There are problems. There's issues with the roads, but those damage-causing potholes have not caused any sensational news story uh, because of the way we've been able to respond to it. Well, speaking of roads, we all face a big uh, question on May 5th about how to fix our roads here in Michigan. I'm wondering, I know you're a Proposal 1 supporter, tell me why, but also tell me what you're hearing from people in Macomb County about it. Yeah, I mean, it's a, I think it was a, a, a failed from its inception, the proposal, but the reality is you got to get out there and try to get people to understand we need that funding. In Macomb County, by doing the whole pothole issue and drawing the attention to it, what we wanted to make sure is that people understood. Uh, many people are upset with DPWs, uh, the county road departments, and MDOT because they think it's their their fault because they're not just uh, they're not fixing roads, and uh, that is so untrue. I, I think the reality is. 
because you've got a lot of road crews out there doing an incredible job of not only plowing the roads, trying to figure out the best way they can to, to fix roads uh, and you know, deal with uh, you know, the issues in the summertime with cleaning the streets. They're doing an incredible job and have been, but they're severely um, uh, under budget, meaning there's not enough money right now or funds to do what we need to do, and that's fix the infrastructure here in the state, in particular Southeast Michigan. So what we did is we, we realized, you know what, it's time to put that uh, pressure on those that are responsible to come up with funding, however they want to do it. I'm not here to be prescriptive in telling them how to come up with that solution. That was their responsibility. The legislature in Lansing, it was their responsibility to figure out how do they fund this properly, and they knew it. So by doing that, we handed it off to the legislature, they accepted that responsibility, but I think they failed the public in this particular situation, and in particular road departments, by giving them a proper solution. It putting it in the hands of the voters with a very complex uh, proposal that people really don't understand. It's tie barred to so many other uh, issues that people are very distrusting of it, and rightfully so. What's so Mark? I don't know what the solution would be. Um, that's not my responsibility to be prescriptive. There have been ideas from pothole or pot for potholes, racinos to, you know, more funding. But, but uh, you're, uh, you're supporting proposal one. I'm supporting it because I need the funding. Yeah. I mean, there's, so you're talking 20 Sort of doesn't sound like it, right? I mean, you, you hard, sound hard like everybody say else saying, oh my gosh, this is an awful right. proposal, but. Uh, right. It's, you know what? It's not the perfect solution. I, I think there probably could be other solutions, but again, it's going to cause, you know, it's going to take some political fortitude for somebody to say, we need to raise taxes and let's just do it. Do you think. Or take money from someplace else to pay for it. That's their responsibility. That's what they got elected to do is to be leaders in that area and make that decision. Do you think it'll pass in Macomb County? I do not think so, no. no. I don't think so. What about statewide? No, I do not think so. So they're a month out. What should they be doing to to push this thing across the line? Something Is there they anything they can do? Yeah, something they should have been doing, I think, from, from day one. It's like uh, any leader does not just say, uh, you know, here's our plan and we don't have a backup plan or plan B. I don't, I don't, I don't care if it's a sports-related uh, okay. situation or team, whatever. You have to have a plan B in place, and you have to be talking about those opportunities that are out there. And unfortunately, there are some whispers, but nobody wants to talk about it because they think it may impact the vote coming up on May 5th. But the reality is they need to. If they have a plan B, Bring it out there, let's talk about it so that, you know what, maybe if that is a better solution and people decide, you know what, I'm going to vote no because I like your plan B better, then that's okay too. There's no no reason why they shouldn't what be talking about it. What is a legitimate plan B, Mark? You know, I, I don't know that there's going to be any way of getting around it, but to figure out how do we raise taxes, whether it's a millage. You know, I've often thought about it. In fact, it's interesting, Nolan, when they talked about this being the 11th hour solution, proposal one, I thought about that and I'm thinking, boy, if, had I have known that, had I have known that, I would have talked to the regional leaders maybe in the in southeast Michigan or an eight county region and saying, listen, I got a better idea. If they're going to be doing that, they're going to raise taxes somehow through some kind of a sales tax, how about we just uh, look at it as more of a millage or some kind of a sales tax on gas just in southeast Michigan so that we can capture all that money? This plan, this proposal that they're talking about, doesn't allow us to keep all that money. There's still Act 51 that comes into play, where a lot of that money is still sent, uh, you know, north of, uh, you know, Macomb County, and others are benefiting more so than what they're getting out of it. So. Is there a way that we could capture all that and with that solution provide a solution for regional transit? So if we decided to do something, whether it's a millage in the, in the Tri-County area, and I'm talking to my uh, partners, uh, my regional partners, to figure out is there a solution that we can come up with aside from what Lansing keeps talking about that may cause for some kind of an increase in, in, in revenue uh, somehow, but yet we capture all that and people know it's going to go directly to roads, nowhere else. I think people will be more receptive to knowing that, you know what, if we know it's going to go to the roads and that regional transit plan, then maybe be more receptive to that. That's, I think, the direction we need to go, but I want to talk further with my regional partners as we move forward here. All right, so what have you been talking to your regional partners about in terms of, of transit in the area? This issue, I mean, I think that's one of the conversations we had was Proposal 1, what do we do? And I think every one of them, uh, from what I've understood and read and had conversations with them, is, you know, reluctantly supporting it. Uh, you know, I think Brooks has uh, has signed up that, you know, he's supporting the proposal, so has Warren, and, uh, you know, I know Mike has too. But the reality is, I think, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for them, but I think they have that same uh, thought that this probably isn't going to pass. And what do we do? So we have sat, sat down and had some discussions as to, you know, what do we think we could do if there is a, a possibility of, having a plan B, you know, that they're not going to come up with, A, B, and Lansing, uh, and our legislators, and, uh, you know, how, how do we get the public to realize, you know, we do care about the infrastructure well, needs. Mark, you, something moving forward. I mean, you're very close to having to go to the voters and ask for funding for the Rapid Transit Authority for Correct. the RTA. I mean, you're, you're asking voters for a lot all in a little bit of time. Correct. And that was, this was, this was very, uh, I think, damaging to uh, the regional transit uh, uh, solution for funding, uh, this proposal. Uh, and that's why I say, if I'd have known that, I would have, I would have tried to corral the uh, regional leaders and saying, hang on a second. Funded all at one shot? 
and, and making sure people understood that that money was going to go specifically to roads and regional transit. I mean, uh, again, I haven't done the numbers, but we talked about that, and I think there is a, a, a tremendous possibility or potential here of getting people to trust that that money is going to go to roads and, uh, and regional transit. It would have been a much uh, less costly, uh, uh, I guess, uh, proposal, if you will, uh, than what Proposal 1 is, and we're not uh, being a donor county or a donor region. I think there is something there, and we're, we're going to be discussing it or having some uh, talks. I'm going to at least encourage that. Some of the other regional conversation you've been having is surrounding uh, the water department in Detroit. Where are we right now with that? It's a challenge. I, I say that for this reason. I think a lot of assumptions that were given, uh, there wasn't a lot of information as we were sitting at the table trying to figure out, you know, where do we go with this and, uh, you know, that memorandum of understanding. Uh, there, were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of issues that I was concerned with, and I still am. Are the savings coming out of the system, or are the savings going to be an increase in rates? And uh, that is going to be the biggest, uh, I guess, uh, holdout during this process. You know, and even during these discussions, you know, it, it, although there's this, you know, so-called gag order out there, um, you know, I cannot continue to just be silent if there are problems or issues that we're seeing. And one of the things that was coming out is, you know, raises for a lot of the people. Is that 10% being, you know, uh, reinstated for, for the uh, employees and beyond that pay raises? Talking about trying to figure out whether the director of the water system is going to get a pay raise. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, how does all this come in when there's a water, a Great Lakes Water Authority that's supposed to be making these decisions right now, yet in the interim, all these deals are, are, are being cut and people are talking about that while this uh, process is taking place. But do, Inappropriate at best. I mean, do you think you can, you can maintain the system that we have, fix it, uh, and prevent it from getting back into the shape that it's in without raising rates? Steve, and Steve my, my biggest concern from the onset was they were trying to give an impression that here we're going to give $50 million a year to the city of Detroit to lease the system. Okay, the privilege of leasing the system. Let's call it what it is. We're trying to figure out how do we pay in our rates more to help Detroit fix their infrastructure needs. Let's be honest about it. I mean, I think that's what should have happened from day one. That didn't happen from day one. What happened was let's give an impression that, you know what, we're going to benefit by having a seat at the table, which still we don't have, you know, we, we're, again, uh, do we have a, a, an opportunity uh, to, to hold off on something by, you know, being that one vote or grabbing somebody from Oakland County to help us with it? Yeah, but still the, the, the benefit of this and the actual uh, authority itself uh, is still to the city of Detroit and Wayne County. And, uh, and the funding issue, boy, I tell you, I'd like $50 million a year coming to Macomb County to help us with our infrastructure needs. Because that $50 million is going to help them with their needs, but we still have to fix our infrastructure issues aside from that. Well, so rates are going to go what, up. Right, I was going to say, but that's where the rates increase comes from, is local, local water authorities that Correct. are going to have to, to fix their own. people are going to think that that's because your local municipality raised your rates, and that's not true. And that's what, the, that's what I think was left out of this, uh, this discussion early on, was the local municipalities who actually buy the water from the city of Detroit, not the county. Wayne County doesn't, Oakland County doesn't, Macomb County doesn't. Right. Where they buy it uh, at the local level, they need to be engaged in these conversations. So they knew up front what was going to be happening and explaining to people why this was going to happen, as opposed to saying, well, the Great Lakes Water Authority is in place right now. Don't worry about that $50 million in the city of Detroit. Your rates will no, not go up more than 4%. And well, we're hearing that's not true already. Well, so, is I mean, it possible to keep rates at 4%? I mean, I don't that know was yet. the implication that's, when it, the MOU was signed. Well, this will cap your rates at 4%. Now we're hearing, well, we didn't really mean cap the correct. rates. We meant... I don't know what the heck they meant, yeah, but I mean, it was 11% right, right. this year. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's, that's the complexity of the issue. That's what we're dealing with moving forward. Can that, uh, can that be true? I mean, are we going to be able to sustain that? And is that going to be something that when they said it to the public that we can own up to? Is that 4%? I said it from the moment they put that out there in NMOU. That is not true. 4% is not going to be, a, that's not a true figure. And can we get to it looking at the numbers and what is finally given to us, what is given to us, because we're still looking for some answers that we're not getting from the books, uh, is, uh, is not adding up. I'm telling you, it's, a, it's still much of a challenge. I want to be regional. I said, it, I said it before they even got into this forcing us into a, uh, a mediation forced mediation. I said it when uh, Mike Duggan was there, Bob Facano, and Brooks Patterson. We had a panel of four of us sitting there. I said, you know what, we need to talk about regionalizing the Water Authority outside of bankruptcy. Let's sit down and discuss this. And everyone agreed. But then all of a sudden I get this call, you're being forced into mediation on, a, on a, uh, an authority to create it. And by the way, you can't talk about it. Well, that was suspect from day one. If I can't talk about it, we can't discuss a regional uh, process. We didn't do that with COBOL. We're not doing it with the uh, uh, Detroit uh, Arts. We didn't do it with the zoo. We didn't do it uh, with regional transit. 
It was all open dialogue, discussion. We may have had dis differences of opinion, but that's how you get to a better solution and one that the public will trust the outcome of as opposed to what we're dealing with right now. Uh, a couple weeks ago, a report came out talking about some population shifts and um, from year to year. Macomb County, you had a little uptick in population, more people moving to Macomb County. Anything that you would attribute that to? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's unfortunate. I hate to see that shifting of population within the region. You'd rather see it coming from people wanting to live here, you know, and uh, again, um, is a it, uh, you know, it's a disappointing. I mean, it's a loss to the city of Detroit and Wayne County. It's our gain, uh, but that's not what I want to see. I would rather see that uh, that shifting of population come from other regions throughout the country to uh, the Detroit area. And I think that day will come. I think there's a lot uh, of, you know, uh, of good things happening uh, with economic development and opportunities, especially in automotive, uh, that are going to help bring that back. The biggest challenge is going to be for the city of Detroit and their neighborhoods, and that's going to be a Mike Duggan and city council issue, you know, moving forward. How do they, you know, provide the services to a, a, a very wide area, uh, you know, that's, uh, that is uh, much less populated than it once was. The downtown area, incredible opportunities, you know, for the entire region. I mean, it's great to see, but we got to start figuring out how they repopulate those neighborhoods or do something different with it. And again, that's, that's uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, Mike Duggan's uh, concern, and uh, we're here to try to figure out how do we support that as, as, as well as we can. All right, Mark Hackle, Macomb County Executive, thanks so much for coming in. It's always good to see you. Make sure you come back and see us, and we'll see you up at Mackinac, right? You bet. Absolutely. Looking forward to that. All right, perfect. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thanks, guys. Yeah, of course, no one can predict the future, but tonight we're going to give it a try. <laughs> what we do, what do we see is the biggest stories on the horizon for Detroit and the state of Michigan. All right, guys, I'm just going to open it up for you. So uh, what do we what do we think? What are the, the biggest things that are going to take uh, that are going to take the headlines in the next couple of months? Nolan? I mean, unless something uh, unexpected happens, it'll be what we've been talking about. It seems like all all winter. We still haven't got I don't think we'll have an answer to the roads question, I think. Um, prop one will fail and then that's going to send Lansing into a real uh, spin over what in the world to do you can't you can't just after the vote throw up your hands and say we tried I mean they're going to have to come up with something this nonsense that there is no plan B well there's going to have to be a plan B. well and there is a plan B I mean we, we've seen uh, these, these proposals to shift money around and, and get rid of certain taxes to, to send to roads uh, is, is still very much alive. It'll be interesting house. to see how that works. It'll be interesting to see actually really how the legislature is going to start to come together because people haven't been very focused on a lot of these new folks here. And so you've got roads, what will happen after May 5th and what the legislature will do. And then you have also the budget. They're working with the governor or maybe not working with the governor on right now. And then if you have the governor throwing out his plans for education, not only in Detroit, but looking statewide, yeah. and that is going to have to involve them as well. So maybe I one mean, of the big headlines is going to be how is the legislature and the governor going yeah, to work together in a lot picture, of these issues. Big picture, you, what you're going to see <laughs> is the, the rift that exists between this governor and the legislators from his own party. If you look at what's going on in the House subcommittees uh, that are looking over his budget, they're going through and stripping out all the stuff that he wanted to put in there in terms of investment. Mm -hmm. uh, the governor's budget asks pretty aggressively for more money for things that we need to, to, to shore up uh, in Michigan. They're going through and saying, well, we don't want to do it that way. In some cases, we don't want to spend the money. In other cases, it's that they want to spend the money differently. They want to they want to give uh, local governments more freedom to decide for themselves. In some of these cases, that's a pretty uh, fundamental philosophical difference between the governor and 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 that party. And he's going to have to, you know, over the next four years, figure out a way to to get uh, people who really don't agree with him. Uh, to, to go along. It's not the same as if he had a Democratic legislature and was dealing with people in another party, but it's not that, that dissimilar either. I mean, there is a real uh, difference in the way that they see things working. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's going to test his skills, and I think he's going to have to be 100% focused on dealing with the legislature, and he's, he's going to have to finally figure out the whole horse training element. Right, he doesn't like to now, make deals. In fairness, yeah, but in fairness, I mean, he got his agenda passed in the first term, and a lot of it involved making deals. So, you know, a lot of the frustration and the criticism uh, of, of his deal-making ability might have been misplaced. Uh, he does have a good relationship with uh, Mikoff, the uh, in the, the Senate, Senate and yeah. the Senate leader and uh, Cotter in the House, and that's key. I mean, those sort of relationships helped him in the first term. He'll rely on them to bring along their caucus rather than, you know, he's not one who goes directly around them and goes directly to the to the lawmakers to bust legs and what have you. But, you know, I think it's his ability to convince the legislature of his vision 
and do it early on will determine the success of that second term. And second terms aren't easy. I don't know, because he's going to have to run again. I more mean, of them are bad than are good. That's yeah. true at the governor's level and, and at the presidential level. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit, um, you know, briefly about education and when he might reveal his education plan. Nolan? I would expect it in a week or two, a couple yeah. of weeks. I mean, he was working on this. He's got the commission's report. Um, he would like to be able to put it out because a lot of it involves uh, budget matters. And I think he still wants a budget done by June 1st. So he's got to put his plan out there and ask the legislature for the pieces of it that um, involve spending, involve more money, and have that included in his budget. So he can't wait until middle May to spring that on him. He's going to have to do it rather quickly. All right. So we're thinking that the main headlines coming out of the year is education, roads, Detroit. Uh, it's always Detroit in, in, in Michigan, and of course we're in that, that sort of pivotal uh, new period with the governor and the council managing on their own. There's a lot of stuff they have to do. There's a lot of stuff they need to get done. Uh, there's a lot of funding they need to get their hands on. This, this, uh, the situation with the federal blight money running out yeah. uh, by the end of the summer, that's, that's for real. And if, yeah. if the mayor can't identify a workaround there, you're going to stop seeing as many demolitions as we've had. And income tax revenue is not meeting projections. Yeah. Now, property tax revenue is outpacing a little, uh, but you know, they, they're going to very quickly find themselves in an upside-down situation again in terms of, of the budget if the revenue projections don't materialize. All right. And finally tonight, it's time. It's time to talk presidential candidates for 2016. We have held out long enough. Won't do it. But with Ted Cruz declaring, oh, you're going to do it. <laughs> Ted Cruz declaring, Marco Rubio expected on the 13th, Carly Fiorina edging toward a run for the GOP, and all signs pointing for Hillary Clinton to announce for the Democrats this month. We can't ignore it any longer. You can't ignore it any longer, Stephen. I'm not talking about it. Well, you're going to have to. Fall. That's it. No paycheck for you today. <laughs> Nolan? Well, I mean, it's interesting that so many of these folks are showing up in Michigan early. I mean, Michigan's a state that's been fairly predictable, predictably uh, Democratic in the general election, but it's still an important state in the primaries. And it's, got, it's an early state in terms of voting, and it's got a lot of, uh, it's got a lot of delegates to offer, and so you you see this week Scott Walker coming in to talk to uh, the Oakland County Republicans. Carly Fiorina is coming in to talk to state chamber. Chris Christie has been in, and I think you're going to see a steady stream of these folks all summer long and into the fall. And we always do. Think back to 08. We had a presidential debate, a Republican At uh, presidential mm -hmm. debate here very early in that yeah. in that cycle. Uh, and that's where Rick Perry um, took a nosedive. I mean, right. that was where he couldn't remember yeah. the fourth or the fifth uh, well, that know, was department. An yeah, and I mean, are we really looking forward? There's going to be 17, 18 candidates in here very quickly. Are we really looking forward to those mass <laughs> debates again? They're, they're no, we're not, we're not looking forward to the mass debates. But what is there about declaring so early your intentions to run that gives, I money. mean, it's, it's just all money? It's a lot of money. And in, in some cases, it's name recognition. I mean, some of the faces you're seeing show up on the Republican side are not people who have strong national followings. They want to take the time to, to raise the money to be able to develop that. I think, I think the Democratic side will be much more interesting than people are giving it credit for. I mean, obviously Hillary Clinton is a, is a you know, uh, a prohibitive favorite, uh, but Martin O'Malley, uh, who I know from, uh, from Baltimore, he was a city councilman and mayor before being governor there, got a lot of stuff done. Uh, in terms of a liberal progressive agenda in that state. He says he wants to run. Uh, I think he will be taken somewhat seriously. Elizabeth Warren uh, still could toss her hat in and, yeah, and, she said recently, and mm, shore she up that, to, that hard left uh, uh, part of the party. There, there is gonna be, there are gonna be things that Hillary Clinton is gonna have to, to answer for and sort of yeah. uh, step up to a challenge. Uh, from before before that's a done deal. And I think as soon as you start hearing Democrats say, gosh, we would like a broader field, as you're hearing now, I think the field's going to broaden. That's going to encourage someone perhaps we haven't even heard from yet. I mean, she's got some serious problems with these emails and they're not going away. It's, it's indefensible to wipe your server of emails that are being subpoenaed. You don't want them read. That are being subpoenaed by Congress. That's more problematic than, than she's letting on. But she's, um, well, she's went up to clear history. Just her. clear yeah, history yeah, from yeah, the last hour. But, you know, this this whole idea of why so early, well, they're, you know, they're trying to lock up the funders. The, you know, the funders, there's not an unlimited pool of funders. There's some major funders out there that everybody wants early on to say, gosh, I'm with you. 
Uh, and so nobody can afford it anymore to wait, say, till September and say, oh, by the way, I'm in. You know? And does it really make a difference where you do it or make the announcement or how you make the announcement at all? No, I mean, there's some sort of, I guess, pageantry to that. But I, 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 I don't think anyone will remember how no. people announce by next spring when we're looking at the primaries. Uh, it really is about, you know, getting people to vote for it. I mean, the, the traffic in and out of Iowa right now is it looks like it would in in January of the yeah. election year uh, this is going to go on for a really well, long and, time and you think about it I mean it's on us fairly quickly I mm -hmm. mean uh, those that Iowa uh, and New Hampshire primaries coming up in January mm -hmm. eight months yeah. um, you know that's not a whole lot of time to organize a campaign and you know those are said to be critical primaries and they want to spend a lot of time. Yeah, and, yeah. and can I again, yeah. I'll start this so again. You got, you got 10 seconds to Four complain, years, go national ahead. National primaries, can we get away from this Iowa, New Hampshire thing? Regional let's, primaries. Let's yeah. have regional yeah. like rotating. Absolutely. I agree. All right, we'll work on that. We'll work on that for I the next election cycle. Years, you do, then you've got to do something about it. All right, that is going to do it for my week. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll continue our conversation online right after the show, so go to myweek.org for an extra segment. We are also on Facebook and on Twitter during the week, so make sure you connect with us there. I'm Christy McDonald. For all of us at Detroit Public TV, we will see you next week. Take care. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michiganturnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta.